Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to LACNIP. This is uh, Lakewood West Neighborhood's regular meeting night. And um, we went together with Boulevard tonight to um, host the mayor's focus forum. Um, there was an unfortunate mix up in dates. So I'm interested in hearing what you have, but um, we'll just uh, start the program and Mayor Berger. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, great to be here. And um, the uh, LACNIP Resource Center is, I, I think, continuing to be creative in approaches to our community gardening activities and uh, aquaponics. Uh, we just want to let you all know to, at the outset that I'm giving a report next week at the Conference of Mayors meeting on the status of the uh, aquaponics. And they're all looking forward folks from Wells Fargo who funded all of that will be there to, to hear that report. But um, We are here as a part of the city focus meeting which moves around town uh, as a part of regular neighborhood meetings uh, to talk about um, city activities, to give you an update on what's going on uh, in uh, kind of bite-sized chunks uh, and uh, answer any questions that you might have. And I want to begin tonight with uh, for his last meeting uh, of this sort. Uh, chief Hefner, the uh, fire chief, is here to uh, uh, give us a brief on the uh, fire department for the last time because as of Jan uh, July 1st, he'll be uh, riding off. Do is there a, a sunset for fire chiefs? No, the fire just goes <laughs> 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 I didn't think so bad for a long time. Well, thanks. Hey, the fact that nobody's here means nothing. The camera's eyes are always open and it's always listening. Better yet, the camera doesn't ask any questions or we'll be out of here in a hurry. And the reason I asked to be first is my son's throwing out the first pitch at the Locos game tonight, and I want to be there watching him just flub it. So that's pretty important to me. At, you laugh. He's a pretty big guy. And he's always very confident. But on the way over, I get a phone call, and it's, hey, Dad, you got a, got a few minutes? I said, why? I want to throw the ball a little bit just to make sure I can get at that 70 feet. <laughs> oh, yeah, he asked. So that was pretty good. Anyway, let's go back to the fire department for a minute. Uh, this is current events and thanks to the fire department. And the, one of the, there's a couple of things I'd like to bring up, and it's, one of them is very important. Uh, we recently received $124,000 from FEMA through their assistance to firefighter grants. Uh, we're going to use this money to buy more breathing apparatus, SCBAs we call them. Uh, it's one of the prime um, pieces of personal protective equipment that we use. And they're, they're very, very expensive. And without, without grants, we would not be able to replace them as often we, as we do with the new technology. Uh, back when these grants started, uh, 2003, we started applying. And since 2003, when the grants started, we've gotten over a million dollars in uh, FEMA grants. I like got a million, almost a million three. Those grants help us keep up with the cost ex escalation. Um, I was looking back at some of the prices we've paid. Back in 2003, our first grant request was for breathing apparatus. Again, it's a very important piece of equipment for us. They ran about $3,500 per set. That's, that's the whole pack in one spare bottle. Uh, the bids are out right now, but we expect them to come back about $8,000 a pack. I mean, that, with that escalation, we can't keep up with, you know, with the, in, the city's income and the fire department budget. We can't keep up to replace equipment like that. So these grants are very, very important. Very competitive, but the fact that we've been successful in, I think, nine, nine or ten of the last 12 years, uh, that says a lot about us, our grant writing ability. And only once did we use a grant writer, and that was one of the years we were not funded. Uh, since we've been doing them on ourselves, I think we've lost out twice. There's been twice we didn't get funded. So I think we do a very good job and also help stretch our budget. Second thing I wanted to talk, talk about, and it's kind of, this is kind of important to us, um, since I went back to 2006 as far as I had accurate records, the call volume of the Lima Fire Department has gone up 250%. Now a lot of that's based, based on our, our taking over EMS. We expected that. But since last year at this time, our call volume's up 10%. Now, a lot of this goes back to we have uh, people have chronic problems and some people that call us, we have some frequent callers. And for a long time it's been, how do we deal with these people? We can't give them what they need. We can haul them to the hospital, but this isn't, this isn't what they need. They need other services. It could be addiction problems. It could be depression problems, a whole host of problems. But they call the fire department, and what we do is we treat them, we take them to the hospital. So we've been back and forth dithering, you know, how can we, what can we do to, to give them what they need, reduce our call volume, uh, take a little load off of the hospitals. 
So in association with Mike Shanehofer and the, uh, uh, the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board, and this was uh, something that Mike came up with after talking with, I believe he talk, spoke with Chief Martin and myself, he actually hired a person, they've got a person who's going to be uh, a liaison between the first responders, police, fire, all over the county, and our patients, uh, or whoever, whoever police and you know, fire refer to them. Uh, we haven't quite filled out how this person's going to work, work the position, but the anticipation, the expectation is if we have a person who, who has needs or problems that we can't solve, just taking them to the hospital is not going to solve, we'll give them the name, the information. This person will con make contact, follow up, give them the resources they need, make sure they get to and from whatever resources they need, and do the follow up and the follow up care. We think that's going to be great. It's going to be great for the citizens who, ha who have a need for these services. It's going to be good for us. It should reduce our call volume. Now, don't get me wrong. Our guys don't mind going out and helping people. But we're tied up. Uh, one woman, and sorrowfully she just passed, but she had some serious depression issues. We were going five, ten times a week to this woman. She had some serious problems, but they weren't all the, that's not always the reason we went. She had other problems. She just needed our assistance. But anyway, sorrowfully, she passed. If we can stop that in the future, it's worth it. And I think Mike, with Mike's assistance, and if he gets the right person in this position, I think we'll be able to do that. Again, great service for them. And it'll be good for us. And then finally, again, no big news. Uh, there'll be some changes to the fire department. As of July 1st, I will, it'll be my last day. We'll have a new chief, a new deputy chief. A lot of this, all the good things that were going on will continue, but there'll be new energy and new ideas. And I think things might even get a little bit better. So we'll wait and see. Um, as far as that goes, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and I, this is my last time presenting as a member of the city administration. That doesn't mean I won't be back. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any questions for the chief? No questions. All right. Thank you, chief. Um, given uh, uh, the season of the year, um, I want to invite uh, Rick Stolle up to talk to us about what's going on in the Lima Parks and specifically because the chief mentioned it, what's happening over at uh, Simmons Field with the uh, improvements we've made. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to get together with with you folks. A um, lot of activities. Uh, excuse the attire. I'm on my way back to the park. We started our softball and baseball tournaments for the little kids, then heading over to uh, the Locos to uh, watch my son play a little bit of baseball tonight. So we're looking forward to uh, uh, a great summer. Again, uh, the pool's a little bit behind schedule as far as staffing, and that is um, with lifeguards. With the pool the size that it is and everyone who's been out to it, we have to have five guards on deck to open up. And uh, we were a little bit short of that when the season, uh, when we normally open up, which was last week, we put together a class in cooperation with some friends of ours in the certification business, and that's going on this week, so we look forward to opening up on the 17th this Friday. Some of the improvements over at Simmons Field, uh, through some private and public monies, we've, we've worked very hard over the last, I think, eight, nine years now with the locals bringing them into the city of Lima. They are a, a destination point for an awful lot of people during the summer who can't get out and go to Detroit or Cincinnati or Cleveland or or Chicago or Pittsburgh to watch ball games and to see some very good baseball talent um, throughout uh, the summer months. Play about 20, 25 home games and um, quite honestly it's pretty good baseball. So uh, what we've done, we've gone out and visited with some friends in the community and have raised an awful lot of money along with some of the public funding that has come along as well and uh, we got a brand new fence that sits uh, around the perimeter of the facility. Last year the Locos invested uh, some money to help us build dugouts, brand new dugouts over there. Uh, the other ones were just too small. Uh, we relocated the bullpens, uh, trying to make it as fan friendly as we can and that's what it really is about, getting people uh, families out to enjoy some baseball so it has been a, uh, a great recreational opportunity for the community and we look forward to continuing to make that a, uh, a great destination point for folks who uh, want to come out and watch some good baseball. How about the deck? The deck is, <laughs> the deck is a, uh, a gift to the city and uh, it's under construction right now and uh, uh, the locos are working with the donor and then giving the deck to the city as part of the facility. Uh, of course, we all know that the locos 
run that facility for um, the months of uh, June, July, and August, and then into some summer or into fall ball, a little bit up to October. So uh, that deck will be there for their use and for uh, others, uh, but we look forward to uh, a additional seating opportunity for folks coming out to the games. It's going to be a two-tiered uh, deck where people can kind of come out and watch ball games. It's under construction, and uh, we look forward to that completion here in the next week or so. Thank you all very much. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Absolutely. The uh, yeah, last year at this time, we were all trudging through about 14 inches of rain. Uh, we're looking forward to the, the Star Spell Spectacular being back on the 4th of July at, uh, at Froat Park. And uh, again, the, uh, the venue is the park. Uh, fireworks right off of College Street. The uh, rides and other uh, activities, uh, bands and so forth, will be uh, what we've been used to. This is our 23rd year. 23rd year again of the you know the city of Lima working with um, St. Rita's uh, Superior Federal Credit Union, the Lima News, um, WLIO, and uh, and and we look forward to you know again finding a, a way to invest you know community dollars together to provide opportunities for the community, and it, it truly is a great day. So come on out, enjoy. Um, the 4th of July activities, I guess it's going to be about 76, 77 degrees, the mayor promised me, and sunshine and a breeze out of the southwest just to help with the fireworks smoke to move on. So looking forward to everyone coming out and enjoying the 4th of July with us at Fro Park. Anything else? Very good. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Gary Sheely, the utilities director, is here with uh, some brief remarks. That was a good. That was a good setup, right? All right. Thank you. I do appreciate being here. Um, I'll talk about some of the upcoming issues, and uh, Mike will probably be up and talk about some of the current things we're doing today. Uh, one of the areas that we're starting to look at is uh, we talked about Simmons Field. Well, what's scheduled to uh, uh, be considered uh, in 2019 is the basin uh, structure that uh, we have to build. It's estimated to be 40 million dollars largest uh, capital investment I think the city uh, will uh, have made once we're there. Uh, we're starting to do the preliminary engineering design of that facility. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, we'd be remiss in doing is not looking at some of the more emerging technologies that's out there. Uh, there's some green technology uh, kind of like on the lines of the stormwater utility and the separation of stormwater from the sanitary sewer. We're going to be looking at that and see if there's some cost savings that potentially we could look at uh, by applying some of that to this project. We looked at it uh, briefly uh, about nine years ago uh, with US EPA, and uh, it hadn't really emerged as uh, the technology it is today. And we kind of backed away from that because of some real unknowns that would have been very costly to the city. Uh, in addition, we're also looking at uh, some advancing um, uh, modeling technologies that would allow us to uh, optimize our real-time control system. In other words, how we store flows in the sewer to reduce the size of the basin until the storm's over, those type of things. So those will be going over the next six months or so, and then what we hope to do is be in a position to uh, have the engineering work done on a final design by 2000, this time in 2018, so we can also look at the affordability of actually doing this project and how well the community can, in fact, afford to do this, and leaves us enough time to go back into federal court and the US EPA and tell them we need more consideration. So it is something I think it's very important uh, so we don't get saddled with a, a structure that we just can't frank with, frank with you afford to build at this point in time. We're also looking at some uh, sewer, uh, what we call the upstream regulators. Excuse me, the segmented block sewer, they're the low end uh, sewers in the system. We've had some engineers out reviewing those. Um, we'll be in front of uh, council here actually Monday night with a, a seven or eight million dollar uh, bond project to basically uh, pay for some of that rebuilding. And, um, and you know, again, it's all about the 100 year old sewer system that uh, you have to reinvest in to ensure it works the way it's designed to do. So, uh, just a lot of those type of projects are, are, are underway. And I think I'll turn it over to Mike now to come up and talk about uh, 
projects he's got underway, particularly uh, some of the things he loves to deal with in the water side. Get a marker and mark that off. Delete that off of here because I got to deal with them every day. So sorry. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, Rick. I did dress up for this. So you know, you got your filters on your cameras, okay? So you kind of tone it down a little bit. Or just, just you know. Okay. Well, Gary referenced uh, some of the projects. The biggest project we have going right now is at our wastewater plant. We call it our Headworks project. It's a little over $26 million project, and it's going really well. Uh, we're over half done with that project now, and uh, actually we have some milestone dates coming up the 1st of August where we're going to start putting some of the new pieces of equipment online, which will be a, that, that'll be a fun time for them at the plant and a good time for the contractors. So they're over half done with that, and it's going really well. It's actually a little ahead of schedule. Gary referenced some of the sewer work. Uh, you know, we're looking at those some of them large diameter sewers, and we'll be talking to council about that this coming week, uh, next week. And we've got uh, a few other jobs going right now, like Gary said, the sewer separation. But we also are uh, doing some work in our billing office. We're looking at a, a totally new billing office software system, which is seems like a simple task but it's not i mean it's a, it's the whole billing software that we have which actually takes a look and gets our hands on almost every account we have and, and the reason we're doing that right now is because next year we plan on doing a, a major replacement of all the water meters in the system we're going to put a new automated water meter reading system with new meters in there and we had to do the billing office software first to be sure that it would be compatible with the read system we're going to put in with the new meters so that'll be quite a job because again we have to touch every account we have and we have almost 29,000 accounts right now on the water side so it wouldn't be so bad if all those uh, meters were out in the curb but uh, half of them are in people's basements and to make the uh, get a reservation to get in and do that work is it'll be quite time consuming and it won't be a real easy job but when we get it done we will have very accurate me meters and we have what and it'll be a, an automated meter reading system where we can actually look at any account at any point in time and see exactly what it's doing we could read all our meters in the whole system at the same time we could sit 1201 a.m we could look at everything that's done and get an exact flow volume of what what's going out we'd have if if uh, the customer's account all of a sudden is higher than normal we would we'd get an alert we could alert them and say hey you may want to look you may have a leak in your system so anyway that's going to be next year and another thing we're also looking at is we're going to start looking at an asset management plan for our water mains you know we have over 450 miles of water mains in the system and they date back to the uh mid 1800s so we have some really old lines there now it isn't really the old lines that give us the most problems but it depends on what year those pipes were made were put in the ground but we're going to take a good look at starting some replacement we're going to start putting money aside every year and start doing taking small chunks obviously we won't have to replace 450 miles of water main but we may have to replace a third of it we're, you know, and you have to do it in really in pieces you can actually do and, and, uh, and not just say we're going to do 10 miles of pipe this year and no we can only do five so it's going to be done now, i read an article today that said there's over 700 water main breaks in the united states every day so that's a lot of water main breaks said that they, you know, we lose over two trillion gallons of water every year through water main breaks that's a lot of water I mean, it's a lot more important, I think, in California than it is here because we have pretty good supply. But uh, so we're going to take a look at those assets and, and start doing some water main change out. So we have a lot of stuff on our plate now and a lot coming. So we stay busy. That's all. Any questions?
probably everything will be outside. Well, the meter, if your meter's in your basement, it'll probably stay in your basement, but there'll still be a read on the outside. It's going to be all read. It's going to, yeah, no. No, well, we do have, we have a remote system now, it, it, but it's not a, what they call an AMI. It's called an AMR. It's an automatic meter reading system where we drive by. When we read meters, we have a fellow in a, in a, in a truck with a laptop computer, and he drives around the city, and those reads automatically are downloaded to him, right? And what we're going to look at, since we have to change out, our meters are 23 years old now. The, the practical, useful, accurate life is about 20 years for meters. So it's time to change the meters. And they've improved so much on the read system now. Is On the reading system we'll probably put in, we'll actually read your meter and send it electronically to our billing office so we won't have to have somebody out going up and down the streets reading the meters. It'll all be done automatically. Any other questions? Thank you. In anticipation of uh, an announcement tomorrow, uh, Amy Odom is here to kind of brief everybody about the status of the two housing projects that are uh, we're hope keeping our fingers crossed for. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you may remember, the city of Lima was very fortunate to put out a request for proposal last year during last year's consolidated uh, planning process where we made available to developers basically a challenge. And the challenge was that we had $500,000 in home funds to make available if someone could produce for us a quality housing product. We were very fortunate to receive two um, applications. One is basically for the rehabilitation of 43 Town Square, better known as the National Bank Building, to make um, a restoration to its lobby, provide two floors of office space, 10 market rate housing units, and I believe over 32 um, two bedroom working, um, entry level working um, income apartments. This is a huge investment by the WOTA group, but it's all dependent upon whether we can get funds from the state of Ohio, the Ohio Housing Finance Agency. And tomorrow on the 15th, they make their announcement of the, the uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credit Award. Um, in addition to that project, another very fine application was received from um, New Lima Housing for the Future, where a um, senior housing village is proposed on the site of the YW WCA on Market Street. So again, I've uh, sent messages to uh, both parties this evening before I came over, Mayor, uh, wishing them the best and hoping to hear from them in the morning. So um, Lima, keep your fingers crossed and we'll certainly be letting you know tomorrow the outcome of that project. That's taken a lot of time within our department, but there's a lot of other exciting projects going on as well, as one that will be taking place right here on July 17th. On Sunday, July 17th, the Welcome Home Lima Fair will be held at the LACNIP Resource Center, partnering with local realtors and um, local mortgage lenders and people who provide um, services that improve the quality of the city of Lima to encourage home ownership. We'd like to invite people to come right here to the LACNIP Center to talk to mortgage lenders and find out more about our parks program, our um, land bank program, other programs that can make it easier for you to um, become a first time home buyer in Lima. And also visit the homes. Um, open houses will be available um, through partner realtors on that day where we will be providing them information about services available from the city of Lima. This is very exciting. This project is actually being sponsored by the Allen County Housing Consortium, a group of over 20 some organizations work to improve housing quality in Lima. So I hope to see you all back here on July 17th. Additionally, we have um, our usual seasonal requests which is it's time to mow your grass, it's time to pick up your uh, trash, and it's time to stay off your front lawn with your vehicles. Um, we do have our inspectors out in force, not only working on complaints, but m maintaining over 600 vacant lots um, and vacant structures by mowing them on a monthly basis to try to keep our neighborhoods clean. If you have any questions or concerns about properties in your neighborhood, we'd like you to give, you a call, give us a call because our land bank might be able to assist you in a obtaining those properties. Um, we are entering a wonderful partnership with the County Land Bank Partnership and trying to 
uh, do a very significant demolition project this fall. Over $1.5 million is expected to come into the county through the county, which can be used for demolition of vacant and tax delinquent properties. There's a catch. We need to hear from you because these can only be taken down if there's an immediate use plan for these properties. Um, we can make these properties available to you at very low to almost no cost. So if there's a vacant property or an abandoned building near you that you have an interest in, give us a call. We'd love to talk about making that available for further development. Um, it's going to be a busy se season for all of us, and uh, we look forward to working with the neighborhoods and LACNIP on a variety of different um, activities to keep our neighborhood safe, clean, and encourage more to move to the city of Lima. Thank you, Amy. Um, Gary and Mike uh, talked about activities, but there's a major transition underway because not only has uh, Chief Hefner announced that he's uh, retiring from the fire department, but Mr. Sheely has also announced that he, he's intent on retiring uh, by the end of the year. So uh, there will be a transition that involves uh, Mr. Caprella uh, becoming the uh, utilities director um, after, let's see, you've been with the city 43 years? So I think he's sufficiently trained to be able to uh, move on up, but also Saul Allen, who's now the streets director, is in training to uh, step into the deputy position. So, Saul, I don't know if you want to talk about your current responsibilities or your future responsibilities, but um, here you are. Uh, short, very short speech talking about what a nice guy Mike is. and I, I'm done now. <laughs> uh, but uh, primarily, I'll stick with the street right now, so that's you know, where most uh, my familiarity is with. Uh, difference a uh, year is made. Uh, like Rick said earlier, uh, last year this time we were fighting rain and uh, a lot of things we would normally schedule for this time of year we couldn't get to. In particular, uh, alley maintenance. Uh, last year we didn't actually complete alley maintenance till late July. Uh, this year I like to announce, you know, with minimum amount of rain we are 70% 70, 70 completed uh, and actually anticipating completing it by the 4th of July. So that, that is going very well this year versus last year. Uh, another good thing with this past winter was being very light. Uh, the amount of salt we had to use was uh, very light as well. So with that being said, going forward, where normally we would have to order 1,500 to 2,000 ton of salt anticipating the next year's winter. This year, we're looking at probably only about 500 ton uh, of salt that we're gonna be ordering for next year. We do have a full salt bin. As a matter of fact, we do have an order that we had to take for this year coming in sometime either Wednesday or Thursday, but it was salt that we had already ordered last year for this year, but it'll just now be coming in this week. So, but that's very positive thing, some sa savings that we will actually look forward to having going into next winter. Uh, also some uh, smaller things that I always like to mention this time of year. Uh, this is uh, garage sale season. With that being said, always a reminder to residents that first of all, garage sales in the city of Lima do require a permit. And on that permit, it says where you can and cannot put your signs. With that being said, if you are one of those people who decide, I like my sign being on stop signs, street lights, and I also like it to be in that area of the curb lawn between the sidewalk and the curb, then more than likely, you will have full opportunity for the City of Lima Street Department to remove your sign. Uh, with that being said, you know, we just like to give you that you know, warning that, you know, if you're going to put out a garage sale sign, make sure it's on private property, not in public right of way. Uh, and that goes for any sign, not only garage sale signs, uh, any sales signs, any type of signage that you would have, please put it in private uh, property. Last but definitely not least in this big item that we're really starting to see a lot of, and I do want to go through this item, is with the springtime, summertime, nice weather, great, great weather, we're starting to see the basketball hoops come out. And, and with that being said, same type of issue you know, that you have with the signs, those, sign, those basketball hoops cannot be left out. And the biggest thing we're starting to see is they're actually being placed in the street. Before, they were always being placed at the curbside. Now we're actually starting to see a lot of them placed in the street. Uh, and what we usually do is there's a sticker we put on, 
and, and we'll remove it back and push it and move it back into your into your yard. Uh, what we're doing this year, second time we come out, we can actually we'll actually look to confiscate those basketball hoops. So meaning we'll actually come out, pick them up, and take them back to central services. Well, you'll have to get them from there. So, but I do want to caution everyone, and I understand kids certain areas you don't have parks near you or something else. But biggest thing is if you are pulling them out there, make sure when you're done playing, move them back. So that's what I always like to say. Thank you. And with that being said, I am will be taking my services to the utilities. And I think we got a pretty good man coming forward. Uh, Warner had it last week and a half, you know, in, in our office, or a week or so in our office right now. And I, I think he'll be fully ready to at least start taking over those that my duties beginning next Monday. Uh, look forward to working with him, helping him out any way possible. So thank you. Thanks, sir. Yep. I'll be probably the shortest. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, just just want to say how happy I am to be part of the city administration. Um, this is a great opportunity for me, having retired from Procter & Gamble, and uh, hopefully I can bring, hopefully I can fill those shoes, <laughs> because it's, it's a really big job, and there's a lot of important work going on right now. I've been inundated with this training I'm going through, but um, we're getting out there, and we're getting in the streets, and we're, um, we're making things happen. So I just really look forward to, to, uh, to great things. And, and working with the city administration. So, thank you. Thank you, Warren. It's good to have you join us, and uh, you'll uh, you'll learn over time that uh, you need to be prepared for whatever comes at you, not just from the public, but from the staff, <laughs> and the and the council, and the council. Um, uh, city finance director Steve Cleves is here, and. Uh, I think he's got some relatively good news to share. Yeah, just in uh, general, in the finance area, the city um, remains in very good uh, shape. Uh, so actually, it's uh, no news is good news, but uh, there is a, a positive uh, element in our uh, situation, and that is our uh, tax receipts uh, through the, the end of uh, May continue to accelerate, um, particularly for withholdings from uh, businesses. Uh, we've managed to increase our withholding amount for these businesses uh, about 10% a year, and it's exceeding again this year. So that's really a major event. Now, withholdings, are, ju are just a fraction of our total income tax, but it's a leading indicator of the economic activity in the area, in the region. So it's, uh, it's, it's good news that we have that 10% increase. It amounts to overall about a 4% increase total, uh, and that's good because it will enable us to maintain our cash reserves for a, a rainy day and a lot of capital needs that we have which are coming in. And we purchased uh, quite a bit of capital equipment in the last few years. Uh, we've hired a lot of people, uh, particularly in the safety services areas, and uh, uh, that, that requires a lot of additional spending. So we really need this increase in the revenues to be able to maintain those, uh, those cash reserves. And uh, at this point in time, it, uh, it looks like uh, We'll be able to maintain about a 25% uh, cash reserve uh, at the end of this year, and hopefully be able to maintain that uh, next year also. Uh, this chart is just to give you a general idea of the size of the general fund and the utility funds of water and sewer. Uh, this is a general fund number. It's about $30 million. Now, that includes uh, primarily safety services, and the legal activities required uh, in, in that area, and that's about 80% of our budget. The other 20% is mostly in the public works area. Uh, in the administrative overhead area, it's about 3% or so. So that's, that's the breakdown of this general fund. And, and the combination of sewer and, and water, they're uh, running this year, you know, uh, 12, 13, 14 million dollars 
per year, but going forward, as Gary and Mike alluded to, we had these really major expenditures, uh, particularly for uh, sanitary sewers. And that's a $100 million plus bill that we're going to have to pay over the next 25 to 35 years, depending on how we can finance this thing. Um, so that's the major challenge from a financial standpoint that the city and the residents are facing right and then that is financing and paying for that uh, sanitary sewer work, which is being done as a result of an EPA mandate. That doesn't mean it's not necessary work. It just means that it's work that ha has always been necessary, but now the regulations are such that we really can't defer it much longer. We have mandates, and, and that's where that money is going to be spent. So and overall, we're in uh, pretty good shape uh, with our finances. and. Uh, don't expect any issues this year or next year, uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll maintain that. Uh, do you have any questions? They know they know everything is just fine. And Mike asked, you know, "Why does the media leave when I show up?" You know, there's good news is not is it's boring. You know, they. <laughs> You got to have a disaster, you know, and then they'll they'll, they'll hang around. <laughs> Chief Martin. That's right. Well, actually, I'm going to start by letting everyone know about uh, something happened to me on my way over here. Uh, since the weather's so nice, instead of driving here, I decided to walk, and only just a few blocks from here. And Mary, you're going to appreciate this. I had a gentleman uh, call out to me and said, Chief, what would you do? And I was a little confused. I looked back and said, what do you mean what I do? And he said, well, you must have done something pretty bad if the mayor's got you walking a foot beat. <laughs> so I, I explained to him I just enjoy walking. <laughs> um, I, I also i am kind of sorry that uh, Chief Hefner had to leave already uh, because I did actually want to use this as an opportunity to publicly say thank you to him because when uh, I first was promoted to chief um, he went out of his way to help me transition into the responsibilities and the uh, uh, to have a better understanding of the issues that I would be facing uh, in that position and, and I've always really appreciated that and then uh, over the last five years since then uh, uh, the working relationship between he and I have only has only continued to grow and I just I've really really appreciated that I'm I uh, only hope that I'm able to be as much help to his successor as he was to me when I assumed my current position. Uh, but in terms of what's going on in the city with the police department, I don't think anyone is going to be surprised to hear that we've had a real increase this year in gun violence uh, over actually the last um, few years. And uh, um, as we are trying to look at this, what we're finding more and more is, is that uh, the overwhelming majority of these incidents uh, are related to uh, other criminal activity and, and to criminal gangs uh, that we do have in the city. And so we are trying to um, deal with the uh, problems from that angle. Uh, we are continuing to try to look for um, the crime patterns using crime numbers. Also information that we're getting from human intelligence sources. Uh, we're looking at, at where we need to put our resources and we're continuing to try our best to put our resources where the most crime is occurring. Uh, and when I mention the human intelligence, I will say a lot of that is coming to us through our neighborhood officers uh, as they are back in the precincts and back out there working. Uh, and so we are trying to work on it from an enforcement aspect, uh, but we are also trying to work on it from the aspect of thinking longer term and trying to reach uh, young people especially um, by interacting with them in non-enforcement uh, types of activities, a uh, couple of which we have going on right now. Um, last week we had the first of two summer student police academies uh, that are being offered. The next one actually is next week. Uh, the first week we had a total of 27 young people that went through the week of uh, student academy. And that gives them an opportunity to engage with several of our officers. Um, and to participate in scenario training and uh, other types of activities that gives them a little bit better understanding of not only what police officers do, but why we do things the way that we do. Uh, and we did have certainly uh, diversity within that group, which was 
uh, good to see because this is strictly a voluntary program. Young people sign up for it and uh, show up on their own. And we had, uh, again, as I said, 27 young people from uh, different area schools. Although now of all the uh, kids we had signed up for last week and for next week, uh, which I believe we've got, I think it's 43 students signed up for next week's uh, academy. Um, uh, it represents um, various schools throughout the county, but I have to say that uh, the Lima, uh, Lima Senior is the school that is most represented. Uh, and again, that's something that's good to see. And in addition to hopefully generating some long-term interest from some of the young people to become police officers, again, it's also even for those that never want to become a police officer, we're trying to help them to better understand, again, not just the what we do, but the why we do it the way that we do it. Uh, and so I, I think that those types of things are very effective. Another activity we have going on uh, right now is um, for the second summer in a row, uh, we are offering a four-week uh, survival training series to kids at uh, the Miss Paul Community Center. Um, we also had provided that same training uh, to uh, foster children from uh, Children's Services uh, earlier this year. Uh, and a lot of people may say, well, gee, survival. But part of the reason why we're using that topic is so that it gives a chance for the kids to get to know us in a way other than just as a police officer and understand that you know we have other lives, other interests uh, outside of, of our jobs as well. Uh, and so again, I think it's something that um, so far seems to, to be a good way to reach a lot of the young people. Uh, and it's something I'm very excited about. Uh, but then in addition to that, uh, again, we're seeing an increase in our call load this year uh, as things happen. Oh, and I guess one other thing I would like to mention in terms of the gun violence that we're seeing is I am uh, really wanting to ask people within our community to, it sounds so cliche today because you hear it a lot on TV, but the idea of see something, say something. You know, if someone knows of activity that, uh, you know, if they know of a young person that's, that's got a hold of a gun or if they know of a young person that's intending to go cause harm to someone else, they need to let us know so that we can try to stop that from happening before two lives are ruined the one of the person who's assaulted or, or possibly killed, and the one who does the assault or the murder. Uh, because again, that, that will permanently impact or destroy uh, two lives, and not to mention all of the family members of every, everyone connected to them. Uh, and the other thing is just that, you know, parents and siblings and friends, they need to become more involved and tell the, tell the young people when they know that they're picking up a gun, put the gun down. And that might sound overly simplistic, but you know, the people who will have the most influence on the young people that are out there trying to shoot at other people are going to be the ones that are closest to them. And so, you know, we need to get this whole community involved in that. And that is all I have. Thank you, Chief. Uh, okay. uh, curfew uh, is something that actually changes uh, June 1st and September 1st. Um, and I will say that rather than stand up here and try to recite all the times and, and have people try to write it down real quick, I'll just let you know that we do have the curfew times on our city website, which is uh, www.lima.cityhall.oh.us. I know I was forgetting something. <laughs> so mayor's got to keep. Maybe I should be out walking a foot beat. Any other questions? Thank you, Chief. Um, I do want to commend the police department on all of the outreach that's underway and has really been geared up over the last two years. I think that the, whether it's with young people or the community as a whole, the whole reestablishment of COP has really been an intense set of activities and I believe it's very much appreciated by the community as a whole, but the creative energy that's underway is, um, is really a genuine thing on the part of the Lima Police Department, and I think it'll pay long-term dividends. Howard Elstro, Public Works Director, is here for, uh, I think, an update on number of construction activities. Well, with Public Works, you've already heard from uh, our Parks Director as well as our Street Division Director, and uh, I've got to say I am very glad to have Warner with us now. and. Uh, it's bittersweet to see Saul Allen go over to utilities, uh, but uh, I think the community can rest assured that uh, with these shifts, we have very, very professional, capable people of taking care of city business, and, and I'm very glad and, about that, and also glad about council's support for uh, getting us here at this point. 
Um, the other divisions of public work include engineering and building uh, and zoning department. Uh, the building department is extremely busy this uh, season. Uh, revenues are up about 26 percent. Um, they were down slightly the past two years, so it seems like maybe the uh, building uh, environment, especially in the commercial area, is coming back. There is a, a few large projects around uh, the city and, and the uh, county. Uh, we, as the certified uh, building department for the city of Lima and Allen County, inspect all commercial buildings and we also inspect uh, all uh, residential inside the city. Uh, the engineering division is looking after some very large capital projects uh, at this time. Uh, the largest being uh, Lima Stadium Park there on Bell Fountain Avenue. The rough earthwork is complete. They are now pouring foundations for the pillars. It will be a stone and uh, metal fence that surrounds that entire park, which will complement uh, uh, Spartan Field. Uh, very exciting. It's been something in the planning, pro uh, planning uh, for years and years, and it's great to see that come together. Additionally, uh, motorists will encounter paving crews. Uh, currently, we have uh, Ohio Department of Transportation working with us to resurface the state routes, about half of the state routes through the city. Uh, we also have our own construction companies in uh, doing uh, work at intersections and on sidewalks, primarily up Main Street, but also around the schools. That's all paid for with grant dollars that we go out and chase during the winter months and bring back home and put to work in our communities. Uh, finally, uh, there will be additional paving uh, yet this fall. Um, those funds come from the Ohio Public Works Commission, uh, some block grant, and uh, some other local resources. So in a nutshell, that's where we are this year. Thank you. Um, relative to the, the stadium park project, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the partners who made that project happen for us. Um, we, of course, had the long um, uh, involvement of uh, Leo Hawk and the R. Hale Family Foundation who uh, uh, purchased property all along uh, Bell Fountain Avenue, uh, demolished uh, the structures, and then has donated um, uh, that real estate to the city. Uh, in addition, we've had the uh, uh, Lima City Schools also uh, donate portions of of the uh, property that they owned and um, and then with frankly the advocacy of uh, representative then representative uh, Matt Huffman um, he was able to secure for us um, uh, state uh, funding dollars that are paying for the construction activities so it will be I think a truly terrific improvement along Bell Fountain that I think will make that location uh, a real destination. It'll be a gorgeous uh, entry feature, but I think uh, with the splash pad in particular, the green space, uh, its availability to be used as a part of uh, events taking place at the stadium, I think that'll really be a major uh, addition to the east side. So uh, we do want to also comment that um, we're continuing to pursue resources and uh, we'll have another application in to the state for track funding. Uh, I, that'll be on council's agenda on Monday again, and which is now, I think, our fourth application this year uh, for the $12 million that's necessary to do the east side grade separation. So um, we're, we're pursuing as aggressively as we can uh, those resources. and. Uh, I continue to be uh, relatively confident that with the pa passage of the transportation bill that the feds put in place uh, last fall, eventually there will be enough money in the pipeline uh, for us to be able to successfully compete that. So um, it will be good to also have that project underway. Uh, we do have two city council representatives here, Rebecca Crair from the Fourth Ward and uh, Teresa Adams from the Fifth Ward, either of you have any comments? No, no comments. Okay. Well, we appreciate being here this evening, appreciate being invited, and uh, uh, always uh, appreciate the opportunity to share what's going on. And I think generally, uh, at any time, uh, 
the city has a lot going on and this is no exception there's enormous amount of activity all around us and and also i should uh, mention um, business and industry is booming here in town i mean we really have a level of hiring activity among employers large and small uh, around lima that is unprecedented uh, in the last 30 years so um, I think that we should all be grateful for what's occurring here. We're in good shape as a community. Uh, obviously, there's always things to work on, but I think that uh, uh, the private sector, the public sector, things are pretty well clicking, and we appreciate the opportunity to share some of that good news with you. So thank you all.